Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? My name is Eric, and I've made it all this way with Michael Kester. Uh, it's uh, me here and we you are. and Bad Cat. Yeah, it's um, a Bad Cat. So when people get this show, I think they're still going to be surprised, because I, I still don't think... Uh, that they, they think, expected us to make it yeah, we're, all the way to the end of the year? We do this episode in oh, particular, that, I yeah, think. No, that's probably When the title serious. finally downloads in iTunes <laughs> or when they go on the website or whatever, I don't they're going to look at this and, and say, really? This is really happening. You know, I don't think the title is what's going to phase them. No, probably uh, not. That's the magic of the decision we made is to intentionally choose a title that sounded like it was a really fun, joyous, sunny... Happiness and uh, it's, kids. It's our... Yeah, it's happiness and kids. It's... uh. It's our final homage to Lazy Sunday films. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. no, I don't think that's it. What it is, I mean, this all operates under a, a terrible false pretense, a presumption you and I are making uh-huh. that any human being is hearing this recording. Right. Normally, we might joke that no one listens to our show when in reality, three to five people listen to our show. Sure. However, this time, I mean... It, you know, if anybody decided they were going to watch Happiness and Kids for the show, they're so mad at us at this point. Yeah. It's just not happening. It's uh, some irritating shit. So this is, um, if you've never heard Double Feature before, welcome one new fan. Uh, if this is, in fact, your first show, this is the kind of show where, you know, we have an NC-17 Double Feature by complete accident today. Yeah, that is what happened. NC-17 to unrated Double Feature was not the intention. That's just the sort of thing you happen to find yeah. on Double Feature. And on top of that, the other thing you're going to find on Double Feature is that somehow we will manage to spoil to NC-17 rated films. Yeah, we And will. if that bothers you, you can skip that using our fantastic chapters menu. People love the chapters feature. They love it. All right, so happy four years, and next time we'll have a wrap up. And you know, we always like to spend the last couple weeks of uh, of the year celebrating the fact we made it to the end of the year, even though we're we're never quite there until the next one starts. So uh, enough of that. We'll save that for the year ender. Let's start with happiness. Happiness was a film that abandoned its uh, NC seventeen rating. And it's a new show favorite, I guess, as yeah, far as the is. director goes. Yeah. Look at this guy just showing up twice towards the uh, the end of the year. Here. Yeah, we did Todd Salons earlier. We paired him with Russ Meyer uh, yeah, right. when we did um, Welcome to the Dollhouse. Sure, and, that wasn't too long ago. Yeah, and uh, we we kind of, I mean, both, I guess both of these films, he snuck his way onto the show. Yeah. A lot of times we choose directors for reasons, you know, we like them, they're interesting, they're Gus Van Zandt. These are all different reasons that a director <laughs> sure. may end up on sure. double feature. But Todd Salons kind of lucked out. We uh, we liked the the cut of his jib to pair up against um, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. Sure. And we had actually a while back, both of us had independently watched Happiness um, almost as a joke to each other. Yeah, it really um, was. I, yeah. I had watched it and I just said, you should watch this movie Happiness. It's I really just, fun. So I got it and I watched it and that and was And we it. were sad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we were. I called you back and I said, what the fuck? <laughs> Which by the way, I was that was during involuntary isolation sure. in normal Illinois. So I was already kind of losing my mind a little bit and you decided that it would be funny for you. Yeah, I see you're really enjoying yourself right now. <laughs> well, I it's just I'm laughing because at the time it was a joke, but upon watching it for double feature, oh, yeah. it turns out it's one of the best films ever fucking made. <laughs> yeah, I know. And it's Isn't hilarious great how that happens. It's so good. The opening of this is my favorite Todd Salons of all the Todd Salons. The John Lovitz, I mean, first of all, John Lovitz. All right, so mm-hmm. let's just state that. I'm not going to exhaustively go through his filmography here, but he did The Critic. And uh, it wasn't too long ago we were talking about Amazon Women on the Moon, or even before that, I guess, during Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, uh, our feelings about you know Roger Ebert and critics. Right. Or our feelings about not having feelings about critics, I right. guess. Um, so The Critic was a show that you know was kind of funny for that. But he's, uh, he just has this, this initial part, and it's fucking great. 
the movie starts in the post breakup line, which is an incredible place to enter. You know, you don't go through the whole getting the character's pass or even the I don't want to see you anymore, whatever right. she said. You start in an awkward place. You've just walked awkwardly into a conversation. Sure. Which is, I mean, really, Todd Salon's right there. Right. Um, and so he, he puts you in that position, and uh, what are you going to do? You're going <laughs> to awkwardly watch the fallout and proceed to watch the fallout for the remainder of the uh, the film. It just lets us in. It, it introduces us to what we've signed up for in the most sufferable moment, really. Well, yeah. I mean, the film is called Happiness, and forgive me for being that asshole sure. that points out the significance of no, the title. No, it's fine. It's you, not just a trick for your friends yeah. or your podcast. <laughs> right. You uh you walk into the film at the moment where happiness has been depleted. Yes. If you take even the the line before, you know, the actual initial breakup line that you were talking about that we never get to see, one of the two people is happy until that line is spoken. Sure. Once that once somebody says, I think we should break up think we should see other people this isn't working out any of the cliche lines which are right. the only ones that ever get used yeah those are them uh it's not you it's no me. one's happy neither party is in a good place at yeah. that point um and that's just that's the rest of the film is all these people who are generally unhappy there are people who are arguably happy um joy's two sisters i yeah. guess are arguably happy the american dream and all the fame and fortune and whatever but the film focuses on the people who have serious problems, who are unhappy. And it's just this, I guess it's just a portrait of them striving to find happiness, even though everyone's just fucked up. Yeah. Happiness is the motivator of the film. Sure. It is the end destination. It's also the excuse for the film. It's the reason we get to see these people and their, uh, let's call them challenges. Yeah. Uh, because they're trying to ultimately find that. You know, that's a scene where, I mean, I can only imagine she feels relief, if anything. A lot of times I'll also watch happiness and uh, think, well, in what moments are the characters getting at least uh, a reprieve from what they've been going through? If not, you know, it, it's a question of, is that happiness for these people? Sure. Are they miserable enough that just the uh, the release of, oh, I can get out of this awkward thing I don't want to be in. Is that enough for her? Right. Is that the best she's going to get, right. really? You know, the emotional manipulation of that scene is great, too. The The fact that she asks him if he's feeling better, and we as an audience kind of feel consoled. Because we're there, and John Lovitz is easily identifiable as the funny person. Mm -hmm. So we're thinking, oh, when does the, the funny kick in after the awkward? And as she's consoling him and consoling the audience, it's it's really right at the moment we stop feeling, uh, you know, the worst for him, which is really how we feel. We sure. feel this is the worst thing that's ever happened in the, the scope of the film. Uh, we start to feel like we're getting better, and then he gives her the ashtray, and it almost brings up just enough guilt that I get excited by the fuck off ending sure you know then you you kind of get the the knife twisting oh he got our present too right. oh it's now i'm starting to feel bad a little bit again oh this isn't for you you should go to hell well and it's great that joy enters our scope of the film as the bad guy yeah and as the <laughs> yeah, bastard right. and then the rest of the film everybody talks about how oh Jill, joy's life oh poor joy so hard trish talks to joy in these barbs though She's not quite, I mean, everything she says has a little bit of a jab at sure. the end. You know, it's, uh, nothing is negative, but it all seems like sort of backhanded compliments. Yeah. If it was even a compliment, that's right. how well it's done. That's with right. how much nuance. You used to be hopeless, but there's a glimmer of hope. Yeah, that's such a dark moment where she says, in, in, in honor of our sisterly transparency, sure. I need to let you in on something. I've always thought you were going to be a failure, but maybe you won't be. Yeah. Hey, look at that positive spin. Responds to, uh, you know, the comment about her music career saying, oh, my music career is going great. And, you know, Trish says, oh, yeah, it will be. Cynthia Stevenson, uh, who plays Trish, just sells all of that stuff with her, just this kind of optimism she exudes. Sure. You know, on paper, it's probably just mean. Yeah. And she makes it, you know, you feel she gives it the backhand. 
um, she kind of did a, a similar thing in Dead Like Me in the uh, the TV show and the awful, awful Dead Like Me film. Please don't see that. Where she played this character of sort of a very real uh, but unrelenting optimism. You know, especially in Dead Like Me to, to contrast that to some of the other characters that were just cookie cutter optimistic mm-hmm. characters. She was the one who could kind of bring a real sense of optimism to that. And she does the same for this film. Before we get too deep into the really messed up characters, I also want to talk about Billy a little yeah, bit. Yeah, the younger son. Sure, yeah. he's um, He's got this obsession with age and maturity that I think is something we talked about a little bit on Welcome to the Dollhouse. Sure. I mean, that was a large part of that is really acknowledging, I guess, would be the word, uh, what kids go through. And I guess we'll see that sure. in the next movie, too. Right what their real life looks a lot yeah. more like because in film and in you know tv and media these days kids are always still painted as naive and unaware and not really you know full well-rounded individuals oh man i wouldn't even say these days i mean think back to the 50s well that's what i mean i mean when i mean these days i mean since media yeah I, yeah i'm sorry these days is such a it doesn't really mean anything when i'm 24 years old uh, <laughs> But Billy, he is a well-rounded character, or at least he's striving to be a well-rounded sure. adult and, and work his way to being a, quote, grown-up. Well, that's his obsession, right? Every time we see him, it's age and maturity, and do you think I'm old enough to be the head of the house, and obviously all these sexual hang-ups he already has at 11. And I think, you know, he's being a kid like they are at that age, focused on wanting to be older, wanting to be an adult, having that. I don't know if that's universally true, but we get so distracted reminiscing in film when we have children in film. We celebrate adolescence. It's fun. It's careless. As adult film watchers, we like to go back to that time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think culturally that's something we do. We forget that maybe not all youth, but some youth, there's an obsession with maturity. Sure. There's a, I was anyways, that's all I could think about is growing up and getting out of, you know, not being surrounded by people who were... I can't really remember back to when I was 11, but you know, high school or college or whatever, going through high school and I had to get out a year early. I couldn't be in high school any longer. And it was the same thing for me in college. I was in college and I couldn't wait to be done with college and be an adult and have my own place. That's not an obsession. It's not a cinematic obsession. You don't see that very often uh, portrayed that way. And then Billy asks his dad about cum. So let's talk about cum. Well, come, uh, that is really an underlying theme to theme the, of the entirety of the film. Come is sort um, of a motif of it is. Todd Salon's film. Um, now, the moment that this film really began to stand out for me when I saw it the first time, sure. and I know we're, we're talking about the same thing here. I know you felt the same way, but when Philip Seymour Hoffman blows <laughs> his load on the wall, yeah, sure, that was such, it's... It's not that big of a deal. It's really not that fucked up. But it's something you never see, something you never think about. And it's handled in such... I mean, I think that when he's sticking the postcard sure. onto it, that's when you realize this is something he does. This wasn't a mistake. Right. He didn't accidentally right. come on his laptop. Sure. This is... You know, every night he calls up some lady, jerks off, scooges on the wall... And then puts more of his collage. Yeah, I think the fact that film doesn't treat it with a joke at all. I mean, this uh, this is such a good wrap up show for the hyper sexualized year four yeah. of double feature. But how many times have we talked about come throughout the year? And it's always for jokes. Sure, it's all, even us putting together this fucking episode is for jokes. Well, yeah, I mean, we could go back to Chillerama if you want to find some come jokes. Well, sure, that, and we referenced a dirty shame quite yeah. a bit throughout the year, for uh, often for that particular scene. But there's no joke here. There's kind of a joke in that he slaps a postcard on sure. it. I mean, that's a little funny in that dry Todd Salon's way. Yeah, exactly. We talked about that with Welcome to the Dollhouse. The jokes are never ha-ha funny. They're, huh, okay, <laughs> funny. Somewhere halfway through, you know, when Billy's starting to ask his dad about uh, all of the sex stuff, there's that that kind of feeling in that scene that everyone has left the theater. Yeah. I mean, everyone has left the theater. I didn't get to see this in a theater. Um, I kind of got to experience that with the aristocrats. I remember talking about that on our show as people just 
evacuated. Yeah. Like, like there was a fucking fire. And just the, the conversation itself is awkward for those two characters to be having. Um, the explanation feels pretty bad. You feel like this is a pretty fucking dark place. Yeah. But it's, uh, he starts asking him, well, have you come? Have you masturbated? You can be right. honest with me. Do you, he starts to ask these uncomfortable questions about, do you need me to show you yeah. or teach you? And it's all made worse after seeing him buy this preteen fucking magazine. Yeah. You know, it's the, the setup for that scene as well as right. the scene itself. Well, you get this, you get this weird feeling, at least I do. You, uh, this is more dealing with Bill than Billy, um, played by, uh, what's the actor's name? Dylan Baker. Yeah. Uh, who we saw back in trick or treat. Awesome. Uh, also just doing weird stuff with kids. Yeah. Well, what are you going to do? <laughs> um, but I always have this underlying feeling that when it comes to Billy, Bill has those urges in check. Sure. Which is why it's so heartbreaking at the end. Yeah. When you realize that his urges are only in check so far as he won't fuck his own son. Well, man, that scene where he's confessing to Billy. Yeah. That's one where we don't have any of the the Todd music that we talked right. about. Uh, if you've ever wondered what a scene would feel like, a typical dark comedy Todd Salon scene without his kind of signature fascination with music. This is seriously about the darkest place in the total sum scope of American film. Yeah. I mean, I challenge you to find Would I don't know. How do you feel about that? No, I think, I think you're dead. I can't on. remember a spot where we've ever been to it. It's a, so a darker heavy place and on it's the show. so real. And just every, every time Billy asks a question, you hope Bill won't answer truthfully. Go, and then every oh, time Bill answers on. truthfully, you hope Billy won't ask another <laughs> question. It's true. And uh, this is the same character who has, you know, these scenes where he's in the oversaturated Disney outdoors. Right. You know, or the, the baseball game, which yeah. is, I mean, it's gross, but because of prior knowledge, sure. it's a twist on that, uh, you know, that bright sunny yeah. outdoor stuff. But other times he has a dark scene like this, or he has a, uh, I mean, really, I remember the scene where he has just this evil lighting. The um, the sandwich aren't, scene. Aren't you going to eat the yeah. sandwich? Yeah. Fucking scary. Followed by, of course, a, a magic mystical music cue telling you that everything is swell. Sure. Well, he lives under the portrait of an American family roof. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a husband. Oh, he's got a job. He's got a child. Everybody's happy. Everything's sure. quaint. So if if... If it's as gonna, if the music is a shut in and is not aware right. of the outside world. And if we're going to look at him in um, in the same light that I was mentioning with the title, in in the pursuit of his personal happiness, mm -hmm. further not even necessarily Bill's, but as a pedophile. And I'm I I know the there's a stigma with the word pedophile. And sure. here on Double Feature, let it be our moment here to try to reprise some of the stigma so a pedophile is somebody who is sexually attracted to children right that is pretty much the literal definition sure. of pedophile now I, I i know we mentioned talking about this but i want to ask you and just to generally pose the question we already covered incest yeah on double feature um do you remember when did we do that uh, there's been many an occasion okay. where we covered incest but i believe it was probably amityville horror I yeah think that was that was it you're right um, we like to ask really hard questions because we realize at this point the we have really uh, weeded out the people who are uncomfortable sure. with these questions. Yeah. In fact, it may just be deranged weirdos that are uh, yeah. listening, which almost makes me uncomfortable. Now, now I've talked myself into being uncomfortable <laughs> with the question. It goes back to that art idea. Go the uncomfortable places sure. that other people don't want to go. All right. So ask me a fucked up question. So Let's play the experiment. Again, it's, it's the same basic question as the incest question. As a pedophile, mm -hmm. if your urges end before practice, sure. if you buy a teen bot magazine and jerk off to a picture of the youngest Jonas brother, sure. or you know you get off looking at a catalog. You're asking if there's an ethical line there. Well, yeah, I'm saying where does it become an evil thing? If you think sexually of children... While that may be fucked up in the general mindset of people, it's only so fucked up because in their head you are victimizing a child, somebody right. who's innocent. But sure. if you're not going out and raping children, sure. 
I'm not saying this in a when we back when we did a uh, video mm-hmm. I'm not saying this in a does this keep your urges in check by sure, jerking off sure. to a youth magazine. Right. But I mean, honestly, isn't fantasy just fantasy? Right. I don't care if somebody's going to fucking look at a goddamn fern yeah, and jerk right. off to it. Right. Sure. That doesn't make me any more uncomfortable than anything else. Sure. No, I hear what you're saying. If we're going to try and examine this objectively, which is an impossible task, sure. uh, tactfully and even more impossible task. The thing that is wrong at the core of pedophilia is that you are having or attempting to have sex with somebody who is not old enough to make a valid judgment about sure. that. You know, that essentially makes you preying on somebody. Sure, it becomes statutory rape. And clearly not okay. So even, you know, even if a child is willing, I, Billy would probably have been willing. He sure. seems to be crushed by the fact his dad won't sleep with him. Right. Again, more dark humor. The kind of humor that would put you in jail some places in the mm-hmm. world. So he might be willing to go along with that, but only because he doesn't know any better. And he's that's, ill-informed, misinformed, or under-informed. Yeah, he's too young to be able to make yeah. that, that decision. Sure. Now, if he's 10 years older, but of the same mindset, it's slightly less wrong, but it's still, again, objectively wrong. Now, if you were to remove him from that equation, I don't think there's a crime it's still incredibly creepy because yeah. we as a culture do not want to think about that and it leads to things that are fucking awful. Sure. Pedophilia is one of those things that it's among the world's greatest crimes. Yeah, right? absolutely. It is one of the most terrible things that exists and therefore we don't want to talk about it. We don't right. want to put it in a film. We don't want to discuss it. We don't want to acknowledge its existence. Sure. So that's why when it comes up as a taboo or somebody, you know, beating off to, I mean, barely legal is okay yeah. because it's barely legal, but illegal magazine would not be okay. And right. as a society, we would all look at that and say, oh, it's terrible because we don't want to even, we just all want to be like, hey, we're on the same page about this pedophilia thing sure. is bad. Yeah. Everybody's, everybody's cool with that. Let's all just shun it every time it comes yeah. up. It's the two minute hate. We just pedophilia yeah. wrong, awful. Great. Thumbs up. Glad we're all talking about the same thing and move on. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I just want I realized <laughs> that it may have come off like I was advocating some sort of child pornography. I'm totally not. This is I, the reason we are not on public radio. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify that I'm talking about picking up like a fucking Sears catalog flipping sure. to the children's clothing section. I guess it would be as wrong as beating off to the home appliances. You're not alone in raising that question. I mean, that is upon repeat viewing something the director, the writer is trying to to point out. I mean, you know, you have this scene next to a scene of his sister-in-law who is saying, oh, if only I'd been raped as a child. Yeah. You know, she's evoking those ideas early on, too. The, uh, the woman who lives in Jersey in a state of irony. <laughs> And it's a it's a great mechanism because she can get away with saying these loaded fucking artsy things and by proxy letting the movie say those. And we go, oh, well, she's the artsy chick. Right. You know, it's for laughs. But she raises some of those questions, too. I love where that relationship with uh, with Philip Seymour Hoffman's character with Alan goes. Yeah. And, you know, him making the calls and her looking for something twisted. But nothing in this movie really tops the final scene. No, it's amazing. Uh, the The way that it ends there is, God, it's just this scene where it can't get any worse, and then it does, and then it does again. <laughs> Puppy kisses, Michael. Puppy kisses. Let's talk about kids. Okay. Kids was an NC-17 film as well that was later released unrated. And as we're scrolling through the credits here... John Davis, not that one. Don't get excited. I know you want to make a funny corn joke. Damn. Um, Produced by Gus Van Sant, Uh another name in here. And then this would be early appearances of a couple different actors we can talk about. But Larry Clark is one of the most enigmatic people that comes from this film. He's the Uh director. He's probably 70-ish now. Wow. But uh, this was his first film. I think he was 52 when he made this Jesus film. Jesus Christ. So when you see a film like this that's supposed to be, it's a raw portrayal of, yeah. you know, life on the streets for these kids or yeah. just just life for yeah, these I mean, kids. It's almost documentary style, fly sure. on the wall. Sure. Um, it seems like a lot of the dialogue is ad-libbed, you know, the gist of this. You know what I mean? Yeah, you're trying to uh, capture an idea in a scene. And the uh, words aren't as important. There's a lot of long scenes and... It just seems really honest and real, and 
made by somebody who's maybe in their late 20s. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, I mean, it's such a huge surprise to think 52-year-old Larry Clark makes this film, or somewhere around that age, sure. I mean, really close. And it's his first film, too, yeah. you know, a film like Kids being your first film. Uh, photography was his primary medium before he started working on film, and I I want to say is still probably what he spends a vast majority of his artistic time doing. He did this collection called Tulsa. It was a book of, you know, rampant, depraved partying, sex and drugs and uh, kids. You know, it's a lot of what's in kids is these young adults doing all of this stuff. Uh, not really as an expose, but mm. more as, I mean, when I think back to Tulsa, I think of the, the participant component of that because that's kind of what that was known for. You know, it's a pretty well-known book of photography. It's the kind of thing, I've never gone to art school, but I imagine you probably, if you do a lot of photography history or, yeah. uh, you know, it would come sure. up in a study of that. It was known for him being a participant in it rather than just an observer. That was a key component to, you know, making it feel more raw, making it uh, as well-known as it was because he was involved. It made everything seem more real. So I guess that makes it not much of a surprise that when he does a movie like Kids, he's attracted to that subject matter. Sure. You know, and having been younger when he came out with Tulsa, I mean, I want to say that was in the 70s. You know, that's uh, that puts him close to the age of 20 or 30 yeah. than when this probably came out. And if he's calling back to that mentally in his 50s, I mean, it's clearly a fascination that, that he still has and something he could uh, think back to. Harmony Corinne wrote this, though, and that's uh, it's oddly another name that's never come up on our show, but Harmony Corinne was 22 when he wrote this, mm -hmm. and it was one of his first real breakout films uh, as a writer. Larry Clark, I think he met him skating, which is kind of weird, weird. Um, but Clark's a big subculture guy, and even in an older age, still interested in skating and you know that entire scene, that kind of punk, uh, 90s punk scene. I think he was probably there taking photos or whatever. So he meets Harmony Corinne. Harmony says, oh, I've been working on this kind of film idea. Larry Clark thinks it's great. And we get the 95 film Kids, mm -hmm. which is an insight to a culture that I've never really seen before. Yeah, it's, it's weird because it's simultaneously almost disgracingly modern. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Sure. stuck in the 90s. Yeah, right. Um. It's it's weird because it's based on this culture that we don't get a lot of in Chicago mm -hmm. and we don't get a lot of in the Midwest. It's the, you know, it's the street youth. It's uh it's 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 kids who are of mixed ethnic race sure. that all still have the hard street lingo and you right. know the the I mean I don't know exactly how to describe it. It's it's a lot of slang, a lot of weird syntax usage. Sure. It's what a lot of people would associate with um, ebonics yeah, and right. ghetto speak. Well, um, I don't know that I'd say we don't have it in Chicago. There was a time where I was working on a lot of stuff down on Michigan Avenue, which is in the loop. I know uh, being a Chicago resident yourself, a place you never frequent right. because it's for fucking <laughs> yeah. tourists, right? But um, I happened to be down there for a little bit of time. And, you know, during the day, you would see quite a bit of that. Quite a, I, I mean, really a lot of it. Just in, um, uh, in the types of crimes that were being committed there. Sure. And, you know, it's a lot of kids running around, pickpocketing, stealing. Right. If you're around the public schools, when school's in session here, you know, obviously there's going to be kids at schools, but you see what I mean. That yeah. stuff definitely exists. I just think we're not exposed to it yeah. at all. Well, I think it maybe that's a testament to what the film is doing is it's, it's showing this thing that does happen and it happens sure. right under adults' noses. And it's these kids who are living adult lives. Yeah. They're living hyper adult lives. Yeah. They're making decisions that at their age, they probably have no right to be making. Sure. Um, well, especially, you know, when you see a bunch of kids doing drugs that are, uh, what, 10 or something. Sure. I mean, it's ridiculous. There's a lot of stuff that puts you on edge, and none of which, for me personally, and I know this is, is the biggest swinger of the film, so I don't know if you want to get to it right away, but the whole, 
spreading of the HIV virus. Sure. I think is is one of the most upsetting things to consider from a youth perspective. Oh, yeah. I've always considered the idea of, you know, spreading a, an STD knowingly or otherwise to be something that happens, you know, in an older adult culture, I guess, because sure. because just like these kids, I never really hear about kids with HIV, kids with, right. you know, serious. Well, they're not talking about it. Yeah, so, exactly. You know, these are the ramifications we talked about in uh, Welcome to the Dollhouse. This idea that kids are sexual at a young age. And if we plug our fingers in our ears and don't talk about it, then, sure. you know, it's also talking in happiness about adolescence. Right. Uh, adolescence is very carefree. And so these people are not responsible. Well, some of them are because some of them go to a clinic and actually get fucking tested. Okay, no, you're right. You're right. Some of them are responsible. That is definitely far and away the the most responsible thing that happens. And that's also the moment where uh, we really realize that it is, in fact, Rosario Dawson. And it is, in fact, Chloe Savini because they were veiled in the group of teenage girls and didn't look like themselves. Yeah, the scene of those girls sitting around and talking. I mean, it's, you know, it's an amazingly frank kind of scene. It uh, it says a lot about Clark's style that, you know, you don't need to think about his spin. Like you said, it's very fly on the wall. So there isn't, oh, what are these characters doing and what is Clark trying to tell us sure. that these characters are doing? Instead, they, it's, you know, the camera's just there. Yeah, and, and they're just living. I mean, that's in their the room, life. You're just listening to what they're saying and, and gathering that sure. for them. There's something amazing uh, about what this movie says about the medium of film in general. As we're watching this and everything is so completely new to us because we're not around kids like this, uh, we see that it's depraved, but we're fascinated by it. Sure. You know, the ability of film as a medium to take us, sort of do the walk in a mile of someone else's shoes, but through art you can do that without actually walking a mile in that person's shoes. You don't have to shadow somebody for a day to see what their life is like. Mm -hmm. You don't have to intern with somebody to see what they do. You can watch this in a movie in a group that, I mean, the the great thing about this is this is the opposite of something like, uh, you know, when we did Happy Go Lucky, which was another kind of, I think at the time we called it human experience Mm -hmm. uh, film or another Mike Lee film, Naked kind of did the the same sort of thing. You'll find a lot of these films popping up, especially in the last five, ten years. I suppose even Gus Van Sant, his films kind of have a take on that. It's the same feeling, but they they tend to surround some sort of events. Yeah. But the the event's not really the purpose of the film though. The purpose is to get to know those characters. And so in a movie like this, I would never follow these kids around for a day. Sure. Even when I was their age, I would never follow them around for a day. Yeah. It's, it's a scary place well, to yeah. go where they do. You mentioned that you wanted to take a shower. That yeah, is, I mean, that all is, throughout the movie, you just need, I immediately washed my hands. They after. go through and it's, it's not all physically dirty. I mean, take if you take a look at something like the party scene at the end, yeah, when uh, she walks in to the party, as, sure. you know, as if it were fucking ground zero, yeah, and there's just filth yeah. and sleeping people touching oh, you each other. You just want to get away from that. You just need to cleanse yourself. The film gives you that feeling. But on top of that, some of these people are just bad people. Yeah, it's true, and and they just leave this this film over your brain just. Uh, Telly, I mean, is the exemplary character sure. of a bad person. Well, in the scene we were just talking about of all the, the girls chatting with each other, that's juxtaposed with the guy's conversation. Sure. And I mean, I really want to come on the show. It would be such an easy exercise to go, how are the women and the men both, you know, terrible sure. characters in this? But I really feel like if there's any kind of portrayal, any spin that's going on here... The women in that group, they talk in a similar way to the men, but they're the ones getting sure. tested. Well, they're saying the same thing. When you look at what they're doing throughout the film, they are kind of the the victims. Yeah. And that should put them in a better light. I don't know if they're more responsible with the exception of those those two girls. Yeah. I think the real differentiation there is the women are the ones being taken advantage of. Sure. Um, not that they're not strong and not that they're not independent, 
because none of those girls in the room. Well, but they're not being raped. I sure. Mean, not, not all of them. Right. But they're still, I mean, again, looking back to Telly, he's taking these, he, he particularly hunts down virgins. Yeah. Right. And, and that's, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. No, except, Jason does it all the time. No problem there. Except he lies to them with the sole purpose of, I mean, his, his I guess his actual motivation is to fuck a virgin pussy, right. which is all well and good. But the reality of the situation is he's actually just hurting them, both physically and in the long term. But he's also intentionally setting them up for disappointment. Sure, he's preying on them. And that goes back to, I mean, it goes back to what we talked about in happiness a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's not illegal, but it's so wrong. And then you get the end cap of he's also shooting them full of a big wad of HIV Sure, and you start to wonder about what creates a person like that. How does sure. that person exist? I mean, a, a great part of it, I guess, is the adolescence, is the, the lack of any kind of maturity or responsibility there. But when you hear the guy's conversation, and maybe why they seem like such monsters next to the girls, is literally everything they're saying is about impressing each other. Right. I mean, every single line. They say nothing without having something to prove every fucking time. And so these are conquests for him. These are, he's going out and he's sleeping with these, these girls so he can brag to his friends. Right. Pretty obviously about that. It's also in that same earlier conversation where they're talking about how condoms don't work, mm -hmm. which is just, it shows also how dangerous and ill informed they are. It's one of those things. I mean, of all the horrifying things that have happened today, most notably uh, us entertaining, challenging conversations about the nature of pedophilia on our show. The most horrifying thing to me is when I hear people say that condoms don't work. Yeah, no, it's true. Let me state very definitively, condoms absolutely work. Yep. Uh, condoms not only work to prevent pregnancy, mm -hmm. but they also work to prevent STDs. It's true. That's just another thing that I want to also put on. Just to feel like somewhere in my life, I have said that in a public forum. That's and good. I can be part of that force. Um. But yeah, you're right. When they talk about that, it's this, it's, it's, you're right. It's terrifying. It's sad. And, but you realize these kids are being raised by each other. Sure. And I'm not sitting here going, blame the parents. Right. Because right. I don't blame the parents. I blame the children. Yeah. I, because, <laughs> yeah. because it, they're the ones to blame. They're, I mean, they're, they're grown up enough to know right from wrong. They're not. Yeah, maybe. I mean, they're, they're not walking into Seven Eleven stealing a forty, thinking this is okay because we can get away with it. I guess that's true. I mean, who the fuck am I to say whose responsibility it is for? You know what I mean? I don't know if they're old enough to know or if they still need ironing out. You're impressionable when you're young. I have no idea. Between what the ages this. of fourteen and seventeen, you yeah, you have to know. Even at that age, if you don't know right from wrong, you at least know who does. And that sure. group of boys is not a group of people who I would particularly, even at 14, I wouldn't sit in that room and trust that they knew better. I don't know, man. I did some scumbag things when I was that age. I mean, nothing nearly on the scale of how bad this was, but I don't think I really developed like a, a personal ethical code till I was in my 20s. If you don't have role models around to do stuff like that, it's it's just something you're not exposed to. That's true. It wasn't until I found people to kind of look up to or books to read or authors or whatever that I kind of went, oh, what do these people think about this variety right. of topics? And, you know, do I like that viewpoint? Or you form a worldview. If you ask these kids about their worldview, well, you get their worldview. It's in the voiceover at the end of the film. <laughs> yeah, right. Their worldview is sometimes you fall asleep and dream about fucking, and then you wake up and you want to fuck. And if I don't fuck something, I'm sad. Yeah, so I guess the answer to the question, who's responsible for that worldview, I don't actually know. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't either. But I'm we can pretty clearly point at the problem there is the worldview. Yeah. Or maybe it's just all that violent shit they're watching on TV. Yeah. You know, sometimes the best alternative to Amelie and Martyrs is really just to do Martyrs twice. Yeah. If you skipped over the films or you listened to the show first before you whatever, if you haven't actually sat down to watch both of these films yet, bagcat.doublefeatureshow.com. 
It's amazing how well that works. It does, and it works fast. You it's and fast I acting bad watched cat. these. <laughs> we watched these films. It was what three and a half hours yeah. of depravity and sadness and misery. And in, I mean, in the first twenty seconds of Bad Cat, we were a hundred percent recovered. Bad Cat is the greatest thing on the internet, or it's certainly the greatest thing our fucking show's ever done. Yeah. Um, it's on the website, doublefeatureshow.com, badcat.doublefeatureshow.com. Our email address is doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. And uh, we will be back next time for a, another show. So what's what do we do at the end of the year? At the end of the year, we basically waste everybody's time for a week, including our own, where yes. we come here to the studio. We watch no films. We watch no way, movies. Which is terrible. We uh, we uh, do a live performance, so it sounds bad. Yeah, it sounds and terrible. We read emails that we've gotten over the year, and we talk about the mistakes we've made over that. Basically, we come here. Do you think the here, show will wind up on that uh, mistakes we've made? I don't home. know. But we come here with a full breadth of honesty and tell you what we've done wrong and what you've done right. And Yeah, uh, don't listen next week. In fact, find yourself some more movies to yeah. see. And, uh, you know, take a week off. Maybe go through a Killapalooza. Do something fun. I guess despite that we will not be, you should still watch more fucking film. Bye.